It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk a bit tonight about uh, the themes of my most recent book, and then since I know the theme of the entire series is facing tough questions, I will face all of your toughest questions and deflect them and evade them and not answer them as best I can. Um, but I find that it's useful um, when the, su the subject of my talk tonight is sort of an interpretation of the state of American religion and American religious culture today and sort of how we got to where we are right now. Uh, but I find it useful to start these talks with a little bit of biography, to tell you a little bit about my own religious background, um, which I don't believe I discuss in the book. So this will give you a reason. It won't be a reason not to buy the book, I guess you could say. Um, but so I grew up in southern Connecticut. Um, and I was raised Episcopalian, which is pretty much the most sort of southern Connecticut form of American Christianity there is. And my father was a lawyer and my mother was a homemaker and they had both gone to elite universities and we were sort of lukewarmly religious when I was a kid. Um, and we went, I went to private schools in the greater New Haven area where most people were liberal and fairly secular or Jewish and secular or some combination thereof. Um, and then when I was about six or seven years old, my mother had a variety of sort of strange allergies, chemical sensitivities, and so on. Basically, all of the things that, if you go to your supermarket today, have inspired the line of like, you know, every detergent brand now has its version that's free of perfumes and dyes. Um, if you go to Whole Foods or some similar, you know, sort of um, gourmet health foodish store and you go to the aisles that are all sort of chemical free and so on, those are pitched to people like my mother. Um, but in the 1980s, there were no versions of that that were free of perfumes and dyes. And so we ordered shampoo from a very strange mail order company. And it was called Granny's Old Fashioned Shampoo. And I was embarrassed to take it to college with me. And anyway, personal traumas. But, um, but so my mother, because she had these illnesses that couldn't really be explained or sort of resolved by her doctors, we ended up sort of investigating various health food diets and sort of exotic cures. And we, you know, she went to a homeopathic doctor. We ate a macrobiotic diet, God help us, for a few, few dark years in my childhood. Um, and she also had a friend who attended faith healing services um, that were held every weekend, Friday or Saturday night, in high school auditoriums around Connecticut. Um, and they were. Uh, essentially a healing ministry that centered around a woman whose name serendipitously, providentially enough, was Grace. Uh, and she herself, I believe, had had some sort of near-death experience and had come back from that experience with a kind of charismatic gift. Um, and so you would go to these services and, um, you know, there would be a sermon and there would be guitar playing and then she would rove through the audience and pick out people who had illnesses and so on and call them forward and pray for them. And then they would go out in the spirit, um, as, as the phrase is. And this happened to my mother and my father. And it was a life-changing event, basically, and it's certainly a... a dramatic trajectory altering event in the history of our family. Uh, so basically when I was between the ages of probably seven and 12 years old, we lived this kind of odd double life where during the week I would go to my liberal, fairly secular private school and lead my sort of northeastern elite semi-secular kind of kind of lifestyle. And then on the weekends I'd go to high school gyms around the state and watch my parents speak in tongues. Um, and we, we sort of eventually drifted away a little bit from this particular ministry, and, but spent a fair amount of time sort of, you know, in the evangelical and charismatic and Pentecostalist worlds and sort of the places where they overlap. Um, for any of you who are sort of students of Pentecostalism, um, we spent, we, we drove all the way to Toronto, Canada, when there was this famous sort of Pentecostalist outpouring at the airport vineyard church, um, which was literally at the Toronto airport. Um, and, you know, that was sort of the next, an, another step deeper into Pentecostalism. Instead of just people speaking in tongues, it was people roaring like lions and shaking on the floor and so on. 
Um, and then probably when I was 13 or 14, my parents were involved with an ill-fated attempt to plant an evangelical church at Yale University's campus. Um, and somewhere in the aftermath of that, my mother started attending a Catholic church in downtown New Haven. Um, and for her, my mother's a fairly mystical personality, I think it's fair to say. Um, the sort of Catholic mystical tradition became a kind of bridge that she passed over from evangelical Protestantism into the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and so she converted when I was probably 16 and I followed suit the year after, so I'm sort of in the unusual position of being neither an adult Catholic nor a, uh, neither a cradle Catholic nor an adult convert. Um, but I, I had sort of the usual reasons that people give for converting to Catholicism. I had deeply researched all of the church's historical claims, as any 17-year-old would. Um, I'd read a lot of G.K. Chesterton, and I do mean a lot of G.K. Chesterton. Um, but I do sort of suspect that it was mostly sort of an adolescent awkwardness around certain aspects of American evangelical Christianity, and I was grateful to attend a church where I could sit in a pew in the back, and no one would come up to me and put their hand on my my shoulder and asked me to testify to how the Lord Jesus had changed my life and so on. So I have to recognize that, that aspect of the conversion. But so in a sense, um, you could say that my family went on a kind of tour of American Christianity when I was a kid, starting in the Protestant mainline, passing through various charismatic in Pentecostalist worlds and ending up in the Roman Catholic Church. And that, that background, I took with me to Harvard and then to a career in DC journalism and now to a position at the New York Times. And I think that it's been, I would say that it's been very helpful to me in many ways professionally because I think it's given me a, I don't think it will come as a surprise to anyone in this room, let me say, that the average person who works in an American newsroom um, is somewhat secular in inclination and maybe just somewhat suspicious of this thing called religion, let alone this thing called Christianity and so on. And so that, just having that background alone, I think gave me an, it, an interesting and distinctive perspective on the world. But I also think that the sort of particular trajectory that, um, that we took during my childhood gave me a sense of sort of, uh, at least to some extent, to the extent that anyone can have this, a sense of sort of the breadth and diversity and complexity of American Christianity that to the extent that the media does focus in on religious debates and controversies and so on, there's a tendency to ignore or underplay, right? I mean, I think it, the media likes binaries, right? Um, and they like, you know, sort of conservative versus liberal, secular versus religious, liberal Christian versus conservative Christian, and of course, above all, Republican versus Democrat. And so almost all stories, especially in the national press about religion in the US, tend to be covered through that lens and related almost instantly to partisan politics of one kind or another. And this was completely the case, I would say, um, during the period when I first started thinking about the ideas that I ended up turning into this book. And that was sort of the aftermath of the 2004 election, George W. Bush's re-election as president, when some of you may remember that um, Bush was re-elected narrowly, of course, and there was this kind of there was this kind of quest among American liberals, a few of whom may work in America's newsrooms, um, to figure out how this had happened. Right? How was it possible that Bush had been re-elected? How was it possible that this man, who they had such disdain and contempt for, had won a majority of the popular vote? Um, and one of the things, one of the data points that was seized on in those um, in those months was a poll showing that Bush had been reelected by so-called values voters, right? By Americans who said that moral values, so-called, had been one of the most important or the most important factor in their decision. And this led to a wave of commentary um, from secular writers 
about sort of the looming peril of theocracy in America, right? Basically the idea that evangelical stormtroopers were, you know, going to knock on their door in the dead of night and drag them away and so on. Um, and, you know, there was the internet cartoon that showed North America divided into the United States of Canada, which encompassed, of course, the states that had voted for, for, uh, for John Kerry, and Jesus Land, the, you know, benighted rest of the United States and so on. And this was, in an interesting way, sort of a mirror image, a secular mirror image of a narrative that religious conservatives had been cultivating for a long time, where the United States was basically a God-fearing Christian country that had been led astray, starting with certain school prayer decisions and continuing through Roe versus Wade and so on by godless secular elites, Hollywood liberals, and so on. So that, that was an older narrative, and in the Bush era, Secular liberals developed their version where America was basically a secular country that had been led astray or was on the verge of being taken over by dangerous theocrats. So you had those sort of, those sort of opposing narratives. And this then opened into a period um, in sort of conversation and debate that was briefly dominated by the so-called new atheists, so figures like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens, who sort of took that secular critique one step further and linked all religions together, linking Pat Robertson to Osama bin Laden and so on, in this narrative where religion and the idea of God itself was a threat to secular or Western civilization, a threat to sanity, and so on. And there was a period, I felt like, where you couldn't turn on the television or couldn't turn on C-SPAN, I guess is the better way of putting it, without seeing Dawkins or Hitchens on a stage like this one having their way with some hapless, well-meaning Anglican bishop. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, those were good times, right? And I, I was on the internet blogging for the American scene or the Atlantic at that point, and I participated in these debates, and I had one unfortunate uh, semi-public debate with Christopher Hitchens that ended very badly for God. And, um, and obviously, you know, those, the questions that were raised in those debates were very important questions, and the, you know, divides, the sort of secular versus religious and liberal versus conservative divides are real and important and matter a great deal. But I also felt like there was, you know, there was a bigger story that these sort of binaries were missing. And it was not the only true story about the last 40, 50 years of American religious history, because we're a country of 300 million people, and there are a lot of true stories about what's happened in the US over the last few generations. But there was, I felt, a story that wasn't being told enough, and it's the story I tried to tell, hopefully somewhat successfully in this book, and it's a story about how America over the last few generations has grown less Christian without necessarily getting less religious. So in a sense, you could argue that both the secular narrative and the religious conservative narratives are correct in certain ways and incorrect in others, right? It really is true that institutional Christianity in the United States has grown steadily weaker, not steadily as sort of an overstatement, but has grown weaker in fits and starts, let's say, um, basically since the early 1960s. Um, but it is also true, just as sort of many secular Americans sometimes fear that Americans as a people remain deeply interested in religious concepts, spiritual ideas, the numinous, the metaphysical, and the supernatural. And indeed, you can, depending on which public opinion polls you pick up and which data points you choose, you could make the case that America is sort of more spiritually inclined along some indicators than it was 50 or 60 years ago when the institutional Christian churches were stronger. So for instance, Americans in the first decade of the 21st century were more likely to report a direct encounter with the divine or with God, more likely by far than people had been in 1950 or 1955. Americans in the 1990s were slightly more likely to say they believed in life after death than Americans had been in the late 1940s when more Americans were attending church. Uh, and then even if you d dive into the studies that you hear a lot about these days, about sort of the rise of the so-called nuns, people with no religious preference, not, you know, Latin mass Catholic nuns, which is, of course, my hope for the next trend. But, um, <laughs> but if you dive into those, those, those studies and you say, well, is this secularization? In certain ways, yes. But in certain ways, many of those people who profess no religion officially will say, well, but I do pray all the time. I believe in God. I believe in an afterlife. I 
consider myself a spiritual seeker, and so on. So you have this interesting and important dynamic, I think, where if you look at America in terms of the strengths of its churches, it looks like America has been secularizing. But if you look at America in terms of the interests and inclinations of its people, that secularization hypothesis gets a lot weaker. Um, and so how did, this, how did this happen? Why, in a country that is in certain ways as interested in God as ever, are the churches themselves weaker than they've been in the past? How did we get to this point? And that's, there are you know, a lot of forces that led to this point, obviously. But um, in, in, in the book, I start out in the 1940s and 1950s and talk a little bit about what I think was distinctive about that religious era. Um, and there are a couple things that I focus on. One is the fact that if you go back to the 40s and 50s, everybody agrees, sociologists of religion and so on agree that there was some kind of religious revival in the United States in that period. People come back from war, church attendance goes way up, there's a huge boom in church construction. This is the period obviously when figures like Billy Graham and others, their ministries take off. You have sort of a, a level of evangelism that people had assumed was kind of dead in the United States or confined to sort of the backwoods revival circuit is suddenly bursting out in cities like Chicago and New York and Boston and so on. So you have this kind of mass phenomenon. Um, but in our era, I think we're accustomed to think of sort of mass religion as you know, going in one direction and intellectual life as going in another and so on. And what's interesting about the 40s and 50s is it's also a period, this sort of mass revival coexists with a real kind of intellectual heyday for a certain kind of um, Christian writing, a sort of public theology of various kinds, um, novels, poetry, literature, and so on. And, if you look back to that era, you can see what looks like a kind of sort of spirit of reassessment, you might say, that takes over Western intellectual life, and particularly in the United States in the aftermath of World War II. This sense that, you know, that the West had sort of experimented with substitutes for traditional religious faith, had experimented with totalitarianism, basically, in its left and right-wing forms, had experimented with ideas that in the 1920s and especially the 1930s had seemed like the coming thing, had seemed like pathways, if not to utopia, then at least to sort of steady progress, a better world that didn't need sort of the older religious ideas that you know were being left behind. And then obviously all of that or most of that ended in not only sort of disappointment and disillusionment, but utter disaster and absolute horror in the course of the Second World War. Um, and this was you know, most apparent, obviously, with Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. But again, by the 40s and 50s, you also had a sort of the beginnings of a kind of real realization that hadn't unfortunately happened before among Western intellectuals about just how bad Soviet communism really was as well. And so in this spirit of reassessment, you had a sort of market, in a way, to put it crudely, for writers and thinkers and novelists and poets who could reach back to an older past, a Christian past, and renew it, reinterpret it, repurpose it, and so on for, um, for a new era. And thus, you had figures who, I think, to this day, in Christian culture in the United States and elsewhere are touchstones and are touchstones for a reason. Figures ranging from, uh, you know, from Reinhold Niebuhr to C.S. Lewis to Flannery O'Connor to everyone in between. Um, and you know, these are very different figures in many ways, but I think that they, many of them shared in common that sense of sort of reassessment on the one hand, revising the story that the modern world told about itself, and then offering a Christianity that had seemed like it had sort of passed through a fire, passed through the fires of you know, the 30s and 40s, the experiments with totalitarianism and their dark outcomes, and had emerged revitalized, maybe stronger than before. And this, this, this mood, I think, then flowed into the way that Christianity engaged with 
politics in that era, um, because of course the 50s and then into the early 60s were the era that produced the civil rights movement, which I think is obviously a more complicated affair and then, you know, we often tend to think about it now, sort of, you know, when it's Martin Luther King is a much more complicated and interesting figure, frankly, than the sort of hagiographies sometimes would suggest. But as complicated as it was, this sort of contemporary narrative about that era, I think, is correct to see it as a kind of paradigm for how in an ideal world or a semi-ideal world we would want Christians to engage with politics. That, it, that the civil rights movement was able to sort of straddle effectively the world, the religious and the secular world. It was able to straddle denominational boundaries and so on. It was able to straddle partisan divides. Um, and it's Republican and Democratic, and also ultimately, I think, and this is a contentious point among scholars of the era, but um, I think I tend to buy into the argument that says that ultimately the success of the civil rights movement depended on the way it used the sort of common Christian heritage of blacks and whites in the South to effectively shame the white community into not necessarily embracing desegregation open-handedly, but accepting it, living with it, and not sort of giving in to sort of more revanchist sympathies, basically. And if you, if you look back to that era, there's you know, a lot of places where the great disappointment of the art, most ardent segregationists is that they didn't have the churches on their side, that the, especially the evangelical churches of the white south were not sort of necessarily four square for integration. They were, you know, they were all about sort of moving slowly and, and, and all the rest of it. But they were, they, they ultimately ended up on the right side in a way that wouldn't have been possible without a kind of, without shared theological premises in a sense. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting, you know, everybody reads or pretends to read Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail in their high school history classes and so on. But if you go back and really read that document, it's a theological treatise. And it's a theological treatise that depends on this sort of shared Christian patrimony. He's pulling from Catholic and Protestant authorities, going back to the Reformation and the Middle Ages and the beginning of the church and so on, in a way that it's hard to imagine a similarly situated political or religious leader doing effectively uh, today. And so you have, again, it's more complicated than that story makes it suggest, but you do have a kind of case study in how a serious politically informed Christianity can straddle multiple sort of human worlds and affect real revolutionary change. Um, and that's held up today because we haven't, I think, seen anything like it since. And we haven't seen anything like it since, in part because that sort of sense of a Christian consensus that King was able to appeal to um, has fractured and dissolved and come apart over subsequent generations. And again, there are many reasons why this is the case, but in my book I suggest sort of four big picture explanations for why Christianity went from this period of sort of relative convergence between the different churches in the United States, relatively constructive political engagement, real intellectual vitality, and then robust demo demographic strength to our own, shall we say, more attenuated <laughs> and polarized era. Um, and the first big factor is, in fact, polarization itself. Um, I think this is something that people in my line of work, political journalism, spend a lot of time sort of talking about and discussing and looking at the various metrics by which American politics has become more polarized over the last few generations. But the simplest version of the story is that the two political parties have basically sorted themselves by ideology since the 1960s and have gone from being sort of coalitions of diverse regional and ideological interests to much more consistent sort of, you know, vehicles for liberalism on the one hand and conservatism on the other. And this is not necessarily a bad thing in certain ways. You can make the case that, you know, as a voter in the American political system, there's something nice about being presented with a very clear choice um, every election day. And if you go back to the 50s and let's say you were, you know, a civil rights-minded um, person living in the South, 
It wasn't clear who, you know, who should you vote for because the National Democratic Party is, you know, in one position, but your local Democratic Party is segregationist and so on. And so there is a certain clarity, right, that polarization brings. And you maybe in certain ways our politics has benefited from it. Um, but from the point of view of Christians engaged with politics, I think it's mostly had a negative effect. Uh, because the goal of Christian engagement with politics, which I think in certain ways the civil rights movement manifested, thank you very much, um, has to be, again, a certain kind of transcendence, right? It, it, it is extremely unlikely from any serious Christian perspective that one political party in one political time and place can possibly have achieved a full understanding of how God's plan for humanity should be translated into political action, right? So this means in turn that when Christians engage with politics, they need to not just become captive to one partisan side or the other. They need to sort of stand outside the process a little bit, calling both sides to account. And they need ultimately for their causes to succeed to find support across the political spectrum. But as the parties polarize and become much more ideological worlds unto themselves, it becomes harder and harder to find that place to stand and to find a place in public debate where you can identify as a Christian first and a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal and a conservative second. And this has, I think, a couple consequences. Um, it has negative consequences first and foremost for Christian political witness, right? Because the people active in politics themselves feel like they have to be more partisan, um, they, th they then in turn become compromised in the ideas, eyes of people who don't share that particular partisan allegiance. So to take the example I'd like to use, I talked about Martin Luther King, talked about Billy Graham. Imagine how different the history of America in the 1950s would have been if Billy Graham had decided the best way to convert America to Christ would have been to run for president as a Republican, which in fact he was, I believe, urged to do by a few people in either 1956 or 1960. And then similarly, imagine how different the story of the civil rights movement had been if Martin Luther King had decided that the best way to advance his prophetic witness would have been to run for president as a Democrat. Well, flash forward a generation to figures who sort of see themselves potentially as heirs to Graham and King, and suddenly it's the most natural thing in the world for Jesse Jackson to run for president as a Democrat in 1984 and 1988, for Pat Robertson to run for president as a Republican. And I don't think it's a surprise that in that transition from Graham and King to Robertson and Jackson, something essential in Christian public witness is lost, that as influential as fig these figures may have been within their respective parties, their ability to witness to the country as a whole was reduced. And as with individuals, so with groups and movements and collectives. If you look at the story of liberal Christianity in the US in the 1960s and 1970s, the period when the more liberal churches went into steep decline, a big part of that story is that liberal Christianity couldn't figure out a way to identify itself as Christian first and liberal second. It wasn't clear where the line between a liberal church ended and the Democratic Party began. And it seemed to a lot of people that it was, the message was simply that Jesus wanted you to be a liberal and vote for Democrats and so on. It was just the Democratic Party at prayer, except they didn't really believe in the efficacy of prayer anyway. So why were you getting up on Sunday morning to begin with? And so you had, it wasn't so much that people lost interest in you know, the political ideals, it was that they lost interest in the religious element um, and ended up sort of satisfying whatever had brought, had brought them towards Christianity in the first place purely through political political activism. So this happened on the left in that era. And then I think something similar happens gradually, but sort of inevitably on the religious right in the 1990s and 2000s. This incredibly tight identification between religious conservatism and the Republican Party both limits, I mean, in a sense it limits religious conservatism's political influence because they're only influential within one party. And, but then it also creates this perception in the country as a whole that to be a Republican is to be a Christian. To be a Christian is to be a Republican. And if you aren't a Republican, well, you probably don't want to be a Christian. If you don't like Sarah Palin, Christianity doesn't really have anything to offer you and so on. And you can see this then showing up in polls 
of, you know, why are people not identifying with Christianity? Why are they drifting away or even identifying against Christian churches? And starting in the 1990s, you see a movement of people sort of disaffiliating from Christianity in part as a kind of protest against the religious right. Um, so you have a sort of, again, that partisan identification ends up repelling people who might be, might be sort of interested in your theology but can't bring themselves to sort of accept the precise marriage of theology and politics. So that's what polarization does to Christian witness. Um, and then you have, obviously, the, the big force that everybody talks about, which is the sexual revolution, right? And, and I don't think I need to go on too long because that's something we're talking about everywhere and every day, and the Supreme Court will be talking about it in the context of gay marriage tomorrow. But basically, it's fair to say that before the 1960s, prior to the sexual revolution, there was a stronger sense that Christian, the sort of basic ethical vision of Christianity where sex was concerned, um, you know, the idea of no sex outside of marriage and so forth, that that was sort of consonant with common sense, not in an absolute and total sense, but that, you know, it mapped onto the world as people actually experienced it. So if you go back to the 30s and 40s and 50s, it isn't that most people, um, you know, are virgins, for instance, when they get married, but it is the case that many, many more people get married to the first person they have sex with. And that premarital sex, right, the term premarital sex comes into, begins as sort of a description of sex that's actually oriented towards marriage. It's people having sex with somebody they expect to marry eventually. In the world that comes into being after the 1960s, after the birth control pill, after the divorce revolution and so on, that matchup between Christian sexual ethics and sort of cultural common sense no longer obtains. And in fact, there's a strong sense that persists to the present day that an ethic of chastity is actually unhealthy, that it's bad for human flourishing, it's associated with patriarchal norms, it's a threat to female advancement, and so on. And then this plays itself out in heterosexual culture over a couple of generations. And then obviously, the issue of gay marriage emerges and seems briefly to be a kind of place where conservative Christians can take a stand, right, where the culture is still willing to sort of be on their side, but then it actually turns out to be a weak point, right, because, you know, homosexuality in the abstract is, seems scary and alien and so on, but gay people in reality are your friends and your neighbors and your children and your relatives, and so in the end, the, the Christian stress on chastity seems particularly unfair and unhealthy in their case, particularly sort of backward and reactionary, and that ends up then coloring debates about heterosexual ethics as well. And I think there have been different Christian responses. Obviously, there have been attempts to sort of accommodate the New Testament stress on chastity to new realities. There have been attempts to sort of draw a firmer line. And I think it's fair to say that none of them have succeeded in sort of completely wrestling with this, with this problem effectively, this sort of divergence between what the culture thinks and does, the way teen and 20-something life is lived right now, and what the New Testament and historic Christianity have to say. So you have sex, and then you have money, right? Because the other thing that happens in America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s is that the country gets richer, much, much richer, in ways that no civilization has ever been so rich before. Um, and you pass from a generation that experienced the Great Depression, that went through a period of intense material privation, to a generation, the baby boomers, my beloved parents' generation, that has never known anything really except plenty. And that, in turn, it doesn't have the kind of direct impact, I think, that the sexual revolution has, but it has a similar, more subtle impact, where, again, you have the New Testament message, the suspicion of great wealth, the suspicion of acquisitiveness, the suspicion of materialism, and that diverges, as it has always diverged, but more profoundly, I think, in a richer society from the way we live right now. And again, this has pushed people towards secularism, not necessarily, but it pushes people, let's say, towards theologies that are more likely to justify prosperity, that are more likely to justify a kind of ideology of upward mobility. It pushes people away from the ministry away from the priesthood in the case of the Catholic Church. Um, if you, you know, this, if, if you look at 
the salaries, the difference between the salary that a lawyer would make in 1947 and that a Protestant minister would make in 1947, there's a, there's a big difference. But it's not that big a difference. There are professions that both seem like plausible places that a well-educated American could sort of step into. And obviously, you know, you, you don't want to think of religious vocations in these terms, but people are human and they do end up thinking in these terms. And so it isn't surprising that as the rewards to the professions that well-educated people tend to go into, law, medicine, banking, and so on, go up and up and up, and the material rewards and the social position of a minister, a priest, and so on stays, you know, pretty much, pretty much where it was, you have a kind of talent problem facing not only the Catholic Church, which obviously has the celibacy issue as well, but many, many mainline Protestant denominations. If you look at things like number of Phi Beta Kappa graduates who go into the ministry in the 40s versus the 70s, there's a huge drop-off in numbers, but also in overall talent that, again, has inevitable an inevitable inevitable impact on the way Christian churches are led and the way the Christian message is perceived and so on. So you have sex and you have money and then I think you have a kind of combination of globalization, mass communication and decolonization. Um, th that you have this period starting in the 60s when television, the Vietnam War, um, the end of the old colonial empires and so on, the world as a whole is beamed into Americans' living rooms or experienced by people going out to join the Peace Corps as wasn't really true before. And it's experienced in a way often that tends to sort of cast a cold light on Europe, the West, um, the old Christian empires and so on. You have a narrative of the rest of the world coming into its own, of the older Christian civilization having committed endless injustices and crimes and so on. And this, again, doesn't push people away from belief in God per se, but it encourages a sense that my one church, my particular church, my Presbyterian church, my Methodist church, in such a big diverse world, what are the odds that my church has any kind of a monopoly on truth, especially since my church or my religion is associated with you know, all of the accumulated wickedness of Western civilization going back centuries. And what's fascinating, of course, is that the same trend is good for Christianity in the areas experiencing decolonization, right? Because suddenly Christian churches, Christian faith are no longer sort of a white man's imposition. They are something that can be considered anew and are considered and indeed embraced. But in the West, in Europe and the United States, there's a sense of sort of, you know, the taint, the guilt that comes with sort of colonial empire joined to this broader feeling of relativism, this sense that the world is too big and varied for one particular creed to have a monopoly on truth. So those are, I think, those are my choices for the big four forces, and obviously they interact with many other forces and overlap with each other in all kinds of ways. But I think the accumulation goes a long way towards explaining why from the 60s to the present day you have had this decline in American affiliation with particular churches and certain ways in American church attendance and so on. And this has not been, this has not been, of course, constant across churches and denominations, right? The story is that everyone knows because it's true is that the decline is steepest in the mainline churches, um, that my own Catholic church goes through convulsions after Vatican II, but then sort of achieves a certain amount of stability under Pope John Paul II. Um, and then in the evangelical world, there's this period of real growth, um, this period in the 70s and 80s when it seems like evangelical Christianity is sort of filling the void left by the main line's decline. But I think from the perspective of the last decade, um, we can say a couple things. One is that in the Catholic Church, the decline that began at Vatican II and then sort of stabilized after John Paul II has to some extent begun again. And here I think you could say the biggest driver is obviously the sex abuse crisis um, and its impact on sort of 
often its impact on sort of lukewarm Catholic practice, people who were Christmas and Easter Catholics falling away and so on. But also if you dig into the polls, there's real sort of more, there's a, been a more sort of foundational, um, a more foundational crisis in a lot of Catholics' faith lives. And so you have sort of a modest but renewed fall in mass attendance. Um, you also, with Catholicism, have to recognize the impact of Hispanic immigration. And if you just start to look at white Catholics, the story of the Catholic Church over the last few generations looks a lot bleaker. You see a much steeper decline that's being masked by uh, Hispanic growth. And then in the evangelical world, basically what seems to have happened is that evangelical Christianity in America has hit a kind of ceiling. Um, that, you know, judged by sort of vitality and strength of individual congregations, of sort of, you know, adhesion between generations and so on, evangelical Christianity looks and is very vital in many ways. But the growth that you saw to some extent in the 70s and 80s and that was sort of projected into a kind of new great awakening by a lot of optimists leveled off and has sort of hit a ceiling, hit a plateau, and there seems to be just a real limit, at least right now, on evangelical Christianity's ability to witness beyond a sort of 20 to 25 percent of the American public's base. And so you're left with a world where even though there is still vitality in American Christianity, overall there's much more institutional weakness and dissolution and a, just a much reduced footprint in elite culture, mass media, and elsewhere than there was a few generations ago. And so what, in turn, what, what forces have seen their influence grow? Well, and this is where we come to the, the subtitle of my book, which is obviously a sort of uh, a uh, modestly inflammatory word for a Catholic speaking at a Protestant school to use, and they're obviously still bad memories from the 16th century and so on. But if we can set those aside just for a moment, um, I think that the word heretic is precisely the right word to use to understand the American religious landscape today. And I say that knowing that it has been, in many ways, the right word to describe the American religious landscape, going back all the way to the founding of our country and the colonial era before it, that America has always been a nation of Christian heretics in various ways, of sort of entrepreneurs and freelancers and people who take a piece of this doctrine, a piece of this church, and weave something new out of it. You know, we are the country of Christian scientists and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Scientologists and everyone in between. But I do think that in our own era, with the decline of the major institutional branches of American Christianity, the churches that have at least made in different ways some kind of real effort to maintain continuity with the Christian past, to maintain a sort of integrity around creeds and doctrines and core beliefs, that the power of sort of the heretical tendency has grown apace. And so it's, but it's, it is heretical in the sense that it is, even when it doesn't necessarily seem to be, it is still profoundly influenced by Christian ideas um, about the world and the nature of man and man's relationship to God and so on. So it is not, I like the word heretic because it makes a contrast between, again, those kind of binaries where the US is either a Christian nation or a post-Christian or even pagan nation. I think, in fact, we're a nation with one foot in Christianity and one foot somewhere else. We're a nation that's fascinated to the point of obsession still with the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. We're just perpetually reinterpreting him so that he slightly, you know, thinks slightly better of the way we live now and so on. Um, and so just to take, I'll just sort of take three pop cultural examples because I think this is, you know, one of, one of the arguments I make in the book is that you really want to look to pop culture to sort of pop spirituality, to, I used to say, the bestseller shelf at Barnes & Noble, but Barnes & Nobles are closing all over the country, so I guess I have to say the religion and spirituality bestseller list on Amazon.com, because that's where, if you want to know where are people who aren't going to church, who aren't identifying with a church or denomination, getting their religious ideas, getting their theology, they're getting it from books and television and movies and so on, but they're getting it from the sort of religious pop culture. Um, and what, what do you find there? Well, you find a phenomenon like the Da Vinci Code, right? Which is sort of, you know, what, what, is, the state of, what is the state of religion in America? Well, 
it's the Da Vinci Code, right? It's a book, it's a book that in certain ways, you, you, know, you read it simply and it's like, well, this is just an anti-Christian polemic. It's certainly an anti-Catholic polemic. You know, you've got the, the, you know, the murderous monk flagellating himself in the basement and you know, the whole history of Christianity is this cover-up perpetrated by Opus Dei and so on, which it is, but don't tell anyone I said that. Um, and so, so you, have, you have that narrative, but at the same time, and this is, I think, crucial to the appeal of all of Dan Brown's books, really, um, and is there's a kind of sort of naive sentimentality about religion as well. And there's this sense that, uh, you know, once, once you strip away the terrible things that the Catholic Church has done or that institutional Christianity has done, and once you get down to the real Jesus, right, the one who was a cool guy who was married to Mary Magdalene and lived in the house in the Galilean suburbs and, you know, and somehow ended up founding a dynasty of French kings, but that's sort of a separate, a separate narrative tangent, that there you'll find sort of the basis for a renewed religious sentiment. And so it's not, it is not a religious mood that wants to give up on Jesus. It's a religious mood that thinks that the truth about Jesus is the biggest secret in the world. It's the one that everybody needs to know. It's just that the big secret about Jesus is that he would actually approve of your lifestyle uh, a little bit more than the Jesus of the New Testament um, or the Jesus of the Catholic Church would seem to. And so that's, it's not so much that people are reading the Da Vinci Code and then sort of building a spirituality necessarily around Dan Brown's, you know, incredibly thin sort of spiritual vision. It's that that's the appeal of that book speaks to where so many millions of Americans are, I think. And it speaks to sort of the, the nature of the culture as a whole, the culture that made a book like that a bestseller. And I think you can then say the same thing, and I'll sort of take two more examples. One sort of more, one more, well, well, we'll do it as money and sex, right? So a figure like Joel Osteen, right? If there is a kind of Billy Graham figure in American culture today, and obviously we're much more fragmented and fractured than America was at mid-century, so there isn't anyone who has quite Graham's position or prominence, but if there is one, Osteen has as good a claim to it as anyone, right? He's the guy who can sell out baseball stadiums. He's the guy whose books all hit the bestseller list. He's the guy who's on 17 different television channels and so on. And what is Joel Osteen offering? Well, he is offering part of what Billy Graham offered, right? In Joel Osteen, you, you see some of the same things that made Graham such a phenomenon and that made Graham different from an earlier generation of evangelists. There's a, you know, an open-handedness, a spirit of ecumenism, a sort of emphasis on God's universal love that is a crucial aspect of Christianity and that people want to hear. And I've, you know, when I do promotion for this, for this book, you, I'll go on a radio show and I'll say something critical about Joel Osteen's theology. And there are often, you'll get somebody who will call in and will say, look, I hear what you're saying about Osteen, but I just want you to know that, you know, there was a moment in my life when I was, you know, as down as I could possibly be in as dark a place as I could possibly be, and I just needed to hear that God loved me. And Joel Osteen said that, and it, you know, it made a huge difference in my life. And that's true and important, and it's an important thing for sort of overly intellectualizing newspaper columnists especially to be reminded of, I think. But it is still the case that in Osteen you have half of, half of Billy Graham. Right? You have the message of God's universal love without an emphasis on God's judgment. You know, you have an emphasis on redemption without an emphasis on sin. You have Easter morning. It's always Easter morning. It's actually, well, in fairness, what Osteen says is it's every day of Friday, but he doesn't mean Good Friday. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, if you want to, if you want to get to the, you know, the, the heart of the problem with Osteen's theology, it's the repurposing of Friday. But, um, but that, and then that segues then into a sort of a spirit of blessing towards people's purely material desires, where what God wants for you is what he's given Joel Osteen, the big house, the big car, you know, the, the material possession, the real estate and so on, um, that, you know, that you always wanted. And it turns out that God has prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. And all you have to do is ask for it, right? And this is, again, it's a tremendously appealing message, but it's a message that doesn't raise any kind of a challenge to 
the way that Americans live right now and instead encourages impulses, I think it's fair to say, that have had some perhaps unfortunate consequences for the American economy over the last decade, like assuming that God will take care of your mortgage even if you can't quite afford it and so on. Um, so you have, that's, that's Osteen with money. And then um, I zeroed in in the book on, on um, the religious memoir Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert, which became a a movie with Julia Roberts, right, which I had never read before I started digging into stuff for this book. And it's a, it's a fascinating book. It's particularly fascinating for me to read as someone who grew up in a family where there was sort of a sense of spiritual questing um, and a sort of mystical side to that spirituality because Elizabeth Gilbert's religious yearnings, her religious pilgrimage is entirely authentic, right? And it's authentic in a way that I think gives the lie to the idea that sort of America is this completely, you know, that's sort of at the highest levels, American culture is just purely secular and so on. Here's this book that was a huge, huge hit and sort of, you know, the toast of New York and Los Angeles as well as, as, well as the heartland um, that is just a book about, in part, a woman having raw life-changing, world-shaking, mystical encounters with God. And it's written in this sort of frank, earthy, unembarrassed, and very, in many ways, impressive way. Um, this woman who sort of turns her back on an upper middle class existence and ends up in an ashram in India, sort of experiencing the divine. But it's interesting, just as it's interesting to take Osteen and contrast him with Graham, to take Gilbert's spiritual journey and contrast it with, you know, St. Augustine, Thomas Merton and the Seven Story Mountain, whatever sort of classic Christian memoir of spiritual conversion you want to take, because Gilbert doesn't convert, right? She leaves, she goes to India, she encounters God in an ashram, but she doesn't consider becoming a Hindu. She doesn't consider sort of ending her journey in a particular place. And she certainly doesn't consider the possibility that God might, the God that she's encountering might impose real moral judgments on her. Instead, the book is about how God helped her leave her husband, escape from the boyfriend she left her husband for, and find happiness in the arms of a handsome Brazilian divorcee in Bali. So it's basically the opposite of the St. Augustine, not the opposite, but it doesn't run in parallel, let's say, to the trajectory of the confessions. Um, and this doesn't, the, what you see is a sense of, you know, it's, it's that spirit of relativism, it's the influence of globalization, whatever you want to call it, but it's the idea, one, that sort of the point of religion is to be like a kind of refrigerator magnet poetry, right, where you're taking a piece here and a piece here and you're writing your own poem and you've got a little Hinduism and a little Christianity, a little Catholicism, a little Lutheranism and so on, and there's no sense that part of the purpose of a relig religious tradition is to call you out of yourself, right? There's no sense that the voice you encounter in your deepest self might be your ego or your libido and not necessarily the voice of the divine. There's no sort of check, whether it's provided by scripture or an institutional church or just a religious authority of, of any kind on what, what Gilbert's personal experience of the divine tells her. And this is Again, I mean, I think, you know, it connects to a lot of things, but as Osteen connects to money, I think Gilbert connects pretty clearly to sex and the extent to which the choices Americans make in their personal lives today are choices that we don't, you know, we don't want a God who would stand in judgment on. Um, and we want, again, the God that we find within who loves us exactly as we are and would never think of judging anything we do. So that sort of, uh, the argument of the second half of the book, in a nutshell, that as, um, as institutional churches have declined, figures like Osteen, figures like Gilbert, the spirit that makes the Dan Brown novels so appealing, that spirit, again, always present in American life, has expanded 
to fill the vacuum. And that then you can see it sort of working itself out in negative ways across our common life, across our economic life, this, you know, in, the, in the, the way Americans spent and didn't save and made reckless decisions across the last decade and a half. In our personal lives, not just in a sort of reductive, you know, people are having sex outside of marriage kind of way, but in a broader turn away from community. In, in all its forms, this sort of the extent to which the sort of decline of the two-parent family is connected to the decline of sort of membership and involvement in churches, but also bowling leagues and civic associations, the extent to which as people have fewer children, their kinship networks shrink, and the extent to which more and more we're sort of a culture that's, you know, of lonely individualists ministered to by therapists and professionals and self-help self -help authors rather than people in communion with other people and ultimately uh, with God. And then also in, you know, not just this isn't, you know, you have our economic life and our social life and then our political life, where I think if you look at the, the sort of pinballing trajectory of American politics over the last five to six years, you can see what happens when people have all kinds of religious energy, all kinds of sort of religious impulses, and don't have an appropriate vessel to pour them into. They pour them into political causes instead. And again, this has been true throughout American history. It's true in every time and place. But there is a sort of, I think, particularly problematic way in which you can go from, on the left, the sort of quasi-messianic atmosphere that surrounded Barack Obama's presidential campaign in 2008, you know, the halos behind his head on magazine covers and the celebrities keening for him on YouTube and so on, to, on, you know, to the reaction to that, which is a kind of crazy apocalyptic spirit on the right where Obama may not be the Antichrist, but he's probably the next thing to it, and he's busy dismantling all our freedoms, and we've broken faith with God, and you know, basically everything that was written on Glenn Beck's blackboard for a year or two in 2000, 2009. And this is, you know, it's a problem in every time and place, but I think it's a particular problem at this moment where people, they may not even understand that these are sort of religious impulses, but the tendency to sort of baptize your liberalism or your conservatism and assume that it is the absolute, the ultimate principle, and that your enemies must be not only sort of beaten at the polls, but defeated in absolute terms. And, you know, the way both sides are always saying, we're going to take back America. We're going to take back America, as though the point of politics is not just to sort of win an election, but to win in absolute terms and to sort of redefine the culture along your own lines, these are sort of w religious impulses gone astray. And I like to believe that they would, they would play a healthier role in our society if people had identities, you know, if people were more likely to identify as Christians in particular, as members of Christian communion, communities and communions in general, and were less likely to see sort of Republican and Democrat as the ultimate identities available to them. So that's sort of a pessimistic account. Um, it's now 8.02. I figure I could just segue into the Q&A and try and offer you some optimism in there rather than, rather than um, sort of trying to give it to you in a limited way now. So why don't, why don't we do that, if that makes sense? Thank you very much, and let's, let's have a discussion. And there are microphones there and there, so if you could go to the microphone and just raise your voice at the end of your statement so it sounds like a question, that, that works, but no. Um, just, I'll, yeah. Hi, my name is Joshua Romero. Um, you seem to present the civil rights movement as the ideal model for Christian engagement, especially with Martin Luther King Jr. But considering uh, a common argument that MLK would not have succeeded without Malcolm X, what do you think that does to your evaluation of the role of partisanship in creating uh, significant reform? Um, the, the question for anyone who couldn't hear it is the possibility that Martin Luther King wouldn't have succeeded without Malcolm X, and thus, I guess, without sort of the in, implicit threat of violence and revolution and so on. I mean, I guess in part, well, I, uh, I don't actually, I guess I'd make two points. In general, I think it's definitely the case that, uh, you know, in 
politics in a fallen world is such that you're always going to find you know, places where sort of a Machiavellian streak makes a big difference and where the threat of violence can be as effective or more effective than moral witness and so forth. And it's also definitely the case that certain forms of moral witness like King's work best in certain kinds of landscapes, right? And so it's not clear with the civil rights movement as it evolved in the 50s have worked as well in the 1880s, you know, in a very different climate in the white south, probably not. Um, you know, you can make the same argument with Gandhi and the British in India, right? What would, what would Gandhi's nonviolent movement have looked like in Nazi Germany? Would it ever have gotten off the ground and so on? So, we, but with that being said, in the particular case, I don't think it's true. I think that if you look at the, I mean, it depends on what you consider the greatest achievements of the civil rights movement, and obviously there are sort of big contingencies at every turn, you know, the impact of JFK's assassination, the impact of Lyndon Johnson's personality and so on. But I, I think that in general, the sort of, you know, the, the more, and Malcolm X is a fascinating figure in many ways, but the sort of the black nationalist phase of the civil rights era, I just, I don't think was essential to, to the major, the biggest gains that the movement made. I think that I think that what what happened in the U.S. in the late 50s and early 60s was was mostly driven by a kind of uh, you know by power politics in many ways, obviously, but also by a kind of successful public shaming that wasn't ultimately about the threat of violence, and that in fact the the larger the threat of <coughs> excuse me <coughs> violence looms across the course of the 1960s. Um, the, I mean, that's one of the drivers of polarization and one of the, you know, civil rights movement sort of its impact dissolves in certain ways in the later 60s and, and early 70s. So there might have been some, I mean, politics and culture are all about sort of balance, you know, they're sort of these moments that come and hold for a moment and then disappear. And it's possible that there was a moment where there was just a hint of a threat of violence plus the witness of nonviolent resistance and so on. And that combination was perfect um, to sort of affect the necessary changes. But overall, I, speaking as a non-historian, I give more credit by far to, to King than to Malcolm X. Yes. Hi. My name's uh, Joby Kessler. and. Um, I guess my question is less one on a social scale than an individual one. Um, a lot of what you said today has to do with politics and the kind of political lines that have been drawn around religion. And you talked about the decline of the liberal church. Um, and I know myself having come from a southern Connecticut town next to Danbury, um, being the only Christian in a group of largely Jewish and agnostic friends, I felt like the odd one out. Um, and now coming to Wheaton, I feel largely the same because my theology and political beliefs tend to be more liberal than those around me. And even having to define them as liberal make me kind of sad, um, I guess. And I was just wondering whether you believe there was any hope for a more liberal church or one that doesn't necessarily identify with the cultural and conservative ideology that so encapsulated the church today in America? So. Um. Yeah, yes to the second question, definitely. Um, Danbury? Richfield. Richfield, Connecticut. My, my wife grew up in Richfield. What, what year did you graduate? Um, well, I didn't, I grew up there and I left for the first three years I, of high school, but then I came back to graduate okay. in 2012, so. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's cool. Um, Richfield's a very pretty town. Um, I mean, so, I think so there, there are two separate, I, I think it, they're sort of related, but let's separate them, right? So you have the particular problem of the churches that right now would identify as sort of liberal Christian churches, right? Which are mostly mainline Protestant denominations. And then obviously you sort of, when you get into the evangelical world, there's sort of the more liberal-ish wings and so on. And, you know, it's Rob Bell or, you know, who, who, what, whatever name you want to pick, right? And that... I think that that style, and I'm grouping a lot of different groups in together, but I think that style has a, it has a sex problem, right? I think the, the, the problem, the particular problem of the liberal churches has been that they haven't figured out how to articulate a sexual ethic that 
sort of fits into the patterns of sort of liberalism in the culture and also appears to be faithful to the New Testament. Um, and I don't consider myself qualified to say if there, you know, if there is, if that ethic exists, right? If that, you know, or if those sort of, those, those group, you know, the, the divergence between sort of secular liberal culture and New Testament Christianity has grown too great. But I think what has tended to happen, I mean, I, I and speaking as, you know, a conservative and someone who's sort of seeing these debates as an outsider, you just, I don't think you can bear moral witness in our culture if you don't know, ex if you don't know what you want to say about sex. Not necessarily meaning, you know, you have to be against gay marriage in these six ways or something, right? I mean, you know, but, but meaning that our culture's problems pretty clearly have a lot to do with sex in ways, you know, it's always been true, but I think you can, you can look at America, sort of post-sexual revolution America, I don't think you can look at it from a Christian perspective and not come to the conclusion that in some sense, sort of sexual disorder is one of our biggest problems. And so for the liberal churches to sort of bear witness effectively, they need to figure out what they have to say about that that isn't just, you know, well, we believe in sort of respecting people sexually or, you know, we are reinterpreting the New Testament to mean sort of a generalized commitment to monogamy that isn't too specific or something. I think they have to figure out a way to get more specific and they haven't necessarily done that. But that's different from the question of can you be part of a Christian community, whether liberal or conservative, that isn't sort of entrapped by political binaries, right? And to that, I think the answer just has to be yes. Right, and because, you know, I mean, it's not, if you happen to be, you know, if you happen to write about politics for a living, <laughs> it's hard, you know, it's hard to avoid political debates in your daily life, as I've discovered. But in general, you know, your primary responsibility as a citizen of the U.S. is voting, and you have a responsibility to be politically engaged and so on. But there's a lot more to life than politics, as much as it may be hard to see it where I live in, in D.C. And, you know, the, the, the central, you know, the, the sort of, the central way people are Christian is in sort of liturgically minded communities, in works of charity, and you know, the sort of the ordinary stuff of a Christian life does not have to be sort of perpetually lived in the shadow of culture war, right? And and again, it's very it's very hard sometimes to escape it, but it absolutely has to be possible to escape it. And having spent a fair amount of time sort of, you know, hopscotching around the country, talking often to Christian audiences about this book and these ideas, I mean, I'm, I'm more confident that you can find those communities now than I was, say, when I, when I finished writing the book. So, they, but there the answer is, you know, finding a community where you feel I don't want to say fully realized because that sounds like the language of eat, pray, love, but where it, it always creeps in. But, you know, finding the community where, you know, you think best represents the Church of Jesus Christ and being part of that community, and that community should not be perpetually torn apart by politics, hopefully. Anyway. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, my name is Annie Dawson. And... It's a very broad question, but essentially, you have been evaluating our pop culture, um, but I was wondering how you think we, especially as young people, how we are called to be in the world, but not of the world, and how we should challenge our culture. That's a broad question. Um, <laughs> how we are called to be in the world and not of the world, and how we should challenge the culture. So, I mean, I talked a bit about politics, right? And I talked um, about the idea of sort of Christian political witness, even if it's involved in partisan politics, needing to stand outside politics to some extent. And for anyone who is interested in politics in particular, that is the message that, while I'm sure I don't live up to it myself, I try and hammer home, right? That the model of Christian political engagement is to not be controlled by your faction, 
to, you know, you're going to, if you're active in politics, you're going to sort into a faction inevitably, because that's how politics works. But you need to find ways to then challenge your own side from within in Christian terms and to find the places where you think your own side is wrong in Christian terms and to prioritize those areas, maybe not as much as you prioritize whatever the most important cause is, but prioritize it because, you know, you have to be, you have to be focused on changing your, your party or faction from within as much as you're sort of focused on the battle against the enemy, you know, out there. Um, but that's sort of specific to politics. In, or, in I was going to say ordinary life, but again, you know, politics is ordinary life. Um, in, in, in family, in work, in neighborhoods, and so on, I mean, I think the, the signal, you know, the, the failures of Christians, as is always the case in human history, is, have been mostly failures to sort of model Christian virtues to their neighbors. And so if you look at something like the debate over marriage and family and so on, which is coming to a head with the gay marriage debate right now and so on, I think it's very clear that at least in the next five to 10 or 20 years, uh, we're unlikely to see some kind of sea change where the Christian understanding of marriage suddenly re-sweeps over the culture and you know everybody is some suddenly, suddenly converted to it. I think what you know what you want to do in your own life is to, if you're married, be a good husband or a good wife, and you know don't um, you know live 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 the Christian life and model what you think a Christian marriage should be and model it in ways that distinguish it from the way the culture as a whole thinks about sex, certainly, but even marriage as well. And I think that this sort of cascades down through other areas of life. I, I have it in the, last, in the last chapter of the book, I have a quote from um, Pope Benedict where he says something to the effect of the only really effective witnesses for Christianity um, are the lives of the saints and the beauty that's created by Christian artists. And you know that, that orientation towards beauty and sanctity, I think, is what Christians have to find a way to offer. And, and you know, I mean, people offer it right now. It's just, I think, if you look at sort of the Christian impact on American culture as a whole over the last few decades, over the last 40 or 50 years, you would not say necessarily that American Christians have brought sanctity and beauty to our common life nearly as much as they should have. And that may be particularly true with uh, beauty. So, you know, you want to live in a world where when a Christian church opens somewhere, it's the most beautiful building in the town. You want to live in a world where Christian families uh, make the Christian view of family life seem attractive. You want to live in a world where Christian communities model sort of the way Christians should approach the poor. And that exists in our culture. It exists all over the place. but. And it will never exist completely, you know, in, in, in this world, but the goal is for it to exist more. And seeking that goal in your own life is ultimately a more important use of your energy than sort of thinking too much about the macro level trends that for my sins I'm paid to think about and write about at the New York Times. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's a sort of sweeping attempt. Hi, um, I'm Ariel Coe. And my question is, uh, how do you think Christians can be good and responsible political actors in a political system that is in danger of becoming an oligarchy run by corporate capitalism? Um, <clears throat> so part of it is just the sort of model that I was just suggesting, right? Where you, you know, you're, you're in a, you have to be in, if you're in a party, you have to be in the party, but not of it, right? If you're in a faction, you have to be in the faction, but not of it. And you have to sort of, you know, model, model the Christian detachment from worldly affairs, but also the sense of sort of Christianity as something that can stand in judgment on both political factions. That's a general point. To the more specific point, I do <laughs> have more specific policy views on particular questions that 
I don't like to urge on Christian audiences as some kind of, you know, perfect ideal Christian politics because I don't think there is a perfect ideal Christian politics and I think it's, again, as I've suggested, sort of a mistake to sort of assume that there can be one. But with that big caveat, what, what I think American politics needs right now is an approach to politics that I think would be an expression of certain Christian ideas and would be in certain ways a marriage of certain conservative with certain liberal ideas. Um, and it's some of, some of the ideas are sketched out in the book that you alluded to. The, uh, I like to call it my fantasy novel um, called Grand New Party about how Republicans can win the working class and save the American dream. Um, but it's, but another way to look at it, there's a phrase that the economist Ed Glazer has called small government egalitarianism, right? Which in our politics can sound kind of like a contradiction in terms, but I think it's a useful way of thinking about politics in a society where on the one hand, our government has basically made unsustainable commitments um, looking forward 40, 50, 20 years. Um, and at the same time, and I, this is an ideological point, obviously because I'm a conservative, but it is, I promise you as a resident of Washington DC, a well-informed point, in its current form, our government does not work that well. And it is, you know, it, it is a system that was built um, you know, the heroic age of American liberalism was in the 1930s, and the second heroic age was in the 1960s, and now we're in the third heroic age, but you're sort of putting new wings on, you know, a huge ocean liner that's encrusted with barnacles here and taking on water over there and doesn't work in six different ways and so on. And to the extent that American society can be renewed and revitalized over the next generation, century, whatever time period you want to take, it is not enough to simply follow the liberal program of saying, well, if we just add a new poop deck up here, the ship will finally be perfect. You actually need to streamline and trim and cut and you know reduce if you want to do new things in other areas. So you need some kind of spirit of fiscal restraint and sort of reform from within and so on, but you need it to take place with an acknowledgement of sort of the broader economic realities. Which, you know, you talked about corporate capitalism. I mean, it, it is, I'm skeptical of the language that the left uses on some of these issues, but I do think it is clearly the case that American society is in danger of becoming far too unequal and far too stratified with too much power concentrated in sort of a nexus of business and government, Wall Street and Washington and so on, and a, spirit, a sort of small government spirit that can't keep that in mind, that just says, well, we're just, you know, we're going to slash Medicaid to the bone and everything will be fine, doesn't deserve to govern the U.S. So you need to take, you know, you take some pieces of what Paul Ryan thinks we need to do to Medicare, and then, you know, but then when you go into the discretionary domestic spending budget, you don't just sort of take an ax to all your anti-poverty programs. You look for programs that encourage mobility, that help support family life, that, you know, s s sort of sustain and support the forms of community that are attenuating right now. And th I'm, this is sort of sketching this out in inchoate terms. If you're interested, you know, you can dig in and there are more specific ideas that various people have put forward. But I think that to the extent that there is a sort of politics informed by Christian ideas about solidarity that is particularly fitted to our time and that isn't being offered by either party right now, it would, it would look something like that. And, you know, maybe it would be family-friendly tax reform plus breaking up the banks. You know, how does that sound? Um, you know, anyway, but so, like, you can, you can get into the details more. But that's sort of my particular, my particular response to the sort of what do we do right now question. And obviously there are a lot of other potential responses as well. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Kyle Lehman. My question is, um, well, first, thank you for your blog, your articles, and, and your Twitter interactions. And that kind of is the source of my, my, conver my question, mm -hmm. is uh, it seems to me like one of the distinguishing features and one of the things I enjoy reading about you, and I think it was evident in your last question, is that you seem to practice what you're preaching, was to to kind of share what you really believe, but also feel like you can criticize a part of your platform that you may not also agree with. I think that really marks your work. My question is, um, was that a conscious decision when you went in? 
because most of writing out there seems to be all on one side or all on another. And if it was a conscious decision, what was that conscious decision? And it seems to me like we get to benefit from that by good interaction with people who seem to take you seriously on both sides. Well, first, that's very kind of you to say. I don't know if I quite live up to that description, but I really appreciate it. I, I think that I, I do think that my writing and my sort of attitudes towards politics have benefited f from certain aspects of my slightly weird upbringing that I described to you. Like my parents, my earliest political memory is of my mother taking me to the polling booth to vote for Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro in 1984. And you know, we were just sort of liberal Democrats growing up and that was taken for granted. And we were liberal Democrats who you know, ate at health food restaurants and read sort of you know, the wacky, crunchy alternative magazines that were in the newsstand there and so on. So, that combined with the eventual ending up in sort of conserv dogmatically conservative Catholicism, I think did give me a, you know, a fairly wide perspective on American politics that I'm not sure every political writer necessarily, um, necessarily has. And then I think that, that that was sort of, you know, I, I'd say in college I was a I was the token conservative columnist for the Harvard Crimson, thus preparing myself for a long career as a token conservative. But, um, but I, was more, I was more comfortable in my conservatism in college because Harvard, as you can imagine, is an extremely liberal school that sort of manifests all sorts of crazy liberal excesses. And all the conservatives you meet there have to be sort of quirky and fascinating in order to remain conservative. So, um, so I wasn't, I came out of Harvard sort of more confirmed in my conservatism than ever. And then going from that experience to sort of coming to Washington just before the Iraq invasion and sort of just going through the experience of kind of the dissolution of the Bush administration from sort of these, you know, the sort of heights of popularity um, that it had risen to just when I got there. And sort of seeing, I mean, I think it's, it's also just that columnists, you know, you write about politics, and at a certain point, you either identify with a cause or a leader, or you become sort of a crank, right? And it's not clear which path I'm going to take. That's <laughs> up to the leaders that the Republican Party produces over the next 10 or 15 years, or maybe the Democratic Party, who knows? But, so, but in that choice, if you find a cause or a leader you identify with, then there will probably become a point at which you know, on the one hand, you'll be fortunate, right? Because, you know, if you're involved in politics, you want to support somebody, right? You want to have somebody who you can root for. You want to have somebody who maybe their policy people read your columns, right? You want to have, you want to have an impact. But it also means that you'll reach a point where it gets hard then to sort of separate your views from the people you're championing. And so if you look back, you can see this with liberal columnists and conservative columnists. You can see columnists who are just Reagan conservatives, right? That was their moment. It was Reagan, they identified with him. Who knows what's happened since, but that's sort of there. And then you have conservative columnists who were Bush conservatives, right? That was sort of the apotheosis of their idea of what conservatism was. And this was true of a lot of, I think a lot of writers who I grew up reading and had deep respect for, like especially I think sort of religious conservative intellectuals who had been often Democrats in the 60s and 70s and had sort of drifted into the Republican Party and they sort of saw compassionate conservatism as sort of this marriage of sort of conservative ideas but sort of Christian ideas and sort of Catholic social justice ideas and so on. But then you, it became hard for them to sort of, you know, deal with what went wrong in the Bush era, right? And in certain ways, some of the conservatives who had been Reagan conservatives had an easier time. Like, I think, you know, if you look at sort of conservative columnists who were, you know, sort of more skeptical about Iraq and were more willing to recognize when things were going badly, it was often, you know, it was the William F. Buckley's and the Peggy Noonan's often because they didn't have that personal investment in, in Bush. And so anyway, that's a long way of saying that, you know, give it five or 10 years. And, and, and but seriously, at a certain point, you know, I mean, I've, I've never been a columnist with a Republican in the White House. At a certain point, I'll be the conservative columnist with a Republican in the White House. And we'll see, you know, how I do with sort of maintaining the, 
independence you admire, or you know maybe I'll become sort of a, a I mean that's the that's the other problem. Like how do you write about American politics if there isn't a party that comes close to embodying your ideas? And I don't know the answer to that, but it's quite possible that you know over the course of my career I'll find out. So the other thing I'll just say is that as a call in the age of the internet, you have to filter. People will often say to me, how do you deal with, you know, the things people say in the comment threads or the things people say about you on Twitter? And personally, the answer is I don't, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I will read things people say about me, but I do not seek out criticism from people I wouldn't otherwise read. So I have magazines I read, I have bloggers I read. If they criticize me, I read it. Maybe I respond, maybe I don't. But there, there are people who will you know, Google themselves and read everything everyone is saying, and I'm impressed by them, I'm amazed by them, but I would never write a new blog post or a new column if I went down those particular rabbit holes. So anyway, yes. Last question, last question. Fortunately, thank no one else is standing, so yeah. it's perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. I was just curious the, to see if, in your research for the book, if you've encountered the kind of trend of people styling themselves as Christ followers versus Christians, um, and if you think the term Christian it still means something in our society that has Joel Osteen and Pat Robertson and everybody in between. Yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> I didn't take up that particular thing, but I, you know, the. The, that particular phenomenon is of a piece with other sort of totally understandable attempts to, I think, reclaim the essence of Christianity that, you know, that many many of the people I criticize in the book seem to have sort of trampled on. I mean, you're you're not going to be surprised to hear that as a Catholic, I think it's a mistake. Um, I think that part of you know the the burden. Well, what is what is C.S. Lewis's line? You know, you're a son of Adam and you're a daughter of Eve, and that's you know pride enough to lift the head of the humblest beggar, and I'm paraphrasing, but you know shame enough to bow the head of the mightiest emperor or something. I mean, that's like the label Christian, right? We have 2,000 years of history. There have been worse Christians, I promise you, than Joel Osteen and Pat Roberts, and some of them have run my own church in the 16th century. So you can't. You, I, I think that it is a, it's a understandable but ultimately sort of misguided view to sort of try and either to separate yourself from the label that you know is arbitrary we could have been Jesusians I suppose or something but it's 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 our label it's how the world knows us and similarly the sort of view that you want to separate your you know I love Jesus but I hate the church right no you the church is the body of Christ right I mean that's that that's foundational and you can't get away from it and maybe that maybe maybe you hate you know a particular church a particular manifestation of institutional Christianity but you you cannot be a Christian alone unless you're Saint Simeon Stylites and you're on a pillar then you can be a Christian alone but if you're not him you can't be a Christian alone and I mean this is to to, to be personal for a moment in my own life uh, you know you I live in Washington I you know we have two little kids at home I you know you I spend almost all of my time working when I'm not helping my wife take care of the kids and I think this is, you know, the biggest it probably comes through in parts of the book that I'm sort of writing about a level of community that I aspire to that I don't myself necessarily always experience. But I, you, you cannot, you cannot escape the fact that, you know, going back to the disciples themselves, Christianity is meant to be lived in community with other people, and that community is called the church. And Whatever, you know, whatever terrible things have been done by people involved in it or done in its name, it's what we've got. So anyway, on that note, thank you guys so very, very much. <laughs>